Hello and welcome to Sirens and Stethoscopes. Today we are talking about whole blood transfusions in the field. So let's get into it. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Kevin. And uh, today we're kicking off a bit of a mini-series talking about blood. And since Dracula was unavailable to join us today, I have with me Aaron. Thanks for joining us, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to talk about uh, some base knowledge on blood. We're going to talk about how it's a fluid choice. We're going to talk about how bleeding does terrible things in the body. And then we're going to talk about how to pick out people that probably need blood as a resuscitation fluid as part of this uh, series of episodes. So in this first one, um, Aaron's joining me to give us some of this base knowledge and talk about fluid choices and maybe how our classic fluid choices haven't always been the best fluid choices now that we've learned some more things. But before we dive in, let's learn about Aaron. Tell us about you a little bit, Aaron. So I've been in the fire and EMS industry now for about 15 years. Six of those are with a little town down south called Kingsville Fire Department where I started out. And almost now nine years with Sugarland Fire Department. Nice. And uh, as we started talking about blood, Aaron graciously offered to uh, help in a very general way. I believe it was with a text um, that I was learning about blood. And, hey, I'm interested in this. And then a couple weeks later, hey, you're on a podcast. Yeah, this, this sounds familiar. <laughs> sounds familiar. So I appreciate your offer to come be on a podcast without offering to be on a podcast. Thanks, Aaron. No, uh, but this is good because in, in your role here in the agency, you're going to be the one delivering blood. You're going to be the care provider that determines this patient does or doesn't need blood. And you perform in a capacity to be one of our clinical supervisors that is guiding somebody else's decision on, yes, maybe we do or don't need blood on that patient. So this is a fantastic perspective that you're bringing to us that I'm really glad that you are bringing to us to, to talk about some of this knowledge, this information, and what goes into these decisions. Because this isn't just a... Uh, okay, there's going to be some obvious ones, right? This person is laying in a puddle of their blood in the street. Okay, they need blood. Or there's the person with a paper cut. Okay, they don't need blood. It's going to be the gray zone in the middle. It's a challenge. Yes. So I appreciate your perspective on this information that's going to feed those clinical decisions and that judgment. So yeah. thanks. Let's do it. All right. All right. Let's, let's start with some base knowledge. Uh, there's blood types. Yes. Talk to me. So we have four blood types. Mm -hmm. Type A, type B, type O and type AB. Okay. And what makes a blood type? Uh, blood type is the two antigens that are in it, type A or type B. Okay. And so antigens are kind of the identifier of what a blood type is. Yes. Uh, but not all blood types play well with each other. No, no, they don't. Uh, some blood types, yeah, they don't, they don't like to be friends. They don't like to be mixed with other bloods. Yeah. So, oh, um, kind of like the the comic book world where we have heroes and villains. Yes. We have antigens and we have antibodies, and they are opposing forces. Yes. That a blood type with this antigen is going to have the opposite antibody. So when you mix those blood types, those antibodies and antigens don't like each other. No, they they fight and then they they clump up. Mm. You know. And that is not what we want. No, no, so. we do not want no clumping in the blood. We wanted a nice viscous fluid <laughs> do so uh we're gonna talk about one specific blood type we're talking about yep. o because that's you know it's going to feed our program yep. and, and some information to know so we talk about when you have the antigens you make the other antibodies type o does it have the antibodies on it yes type o makes antibodies against a and b but do we have antigens on o that the antibodies attack no so we do not this this is what makes O special, right? Yes. Like there's, sure there's, I guess the villains. If we're calling the antibodies the villains, usually yeah. they're good. I, they'll get mad at me. Not villains. Okay, there's <laughs> antibodies, but there's nothing for them to go after. There's no problem to attack. So while A has its antibodies, there's nothing on O blood for those antibodies to attack. Yes. And same thing with B, making it our universal donor. Yep. All right. So this is great. So spoiler alert, we're going to carry O blood in our in our program. Um, I We are not the first ones. Like there are a handful of other pre-hospital agencies that are carrying whole blood. 
Uh, we're copying some of their practices that have been successful. So let, I want to be very clear. We're not the first ones. I'm just very excited about it here in the city of Sugar Land. <laughs> uh, but they're all carrying type O blood. Yep. Yeah. All right. To be specific, low titer O positive blood. Mm, okay, so we have positive and negative blood. What's an RH factor? So an RH factor is a protein that is on your red blood cell. So another thing for antibodies to attack. Yes. Man, okay. Uh, and it's worth noting that anybody with a negative blood type can receive that blood type in positive once. Because what happens then? Because on the second time your body will make antibodies to attack the antibodies. Okay, so you are, you're O positive. I am O positive, positive. yes. O negative, so you can graciously give me some O positive blood, Yes. and I'm gonna build up antibodies that attack your positive, even though we're both O. Yes. Man, okay. So we're carrying type O blood, and we're carrying type O positive blood. Okay. Yes. Aaron, help, you mentioned low titer. Help us connect those dots of how is it okay that we're carrying O positive blood and giving it to somebody without knowing their blood type? So again, like we had said earlier, type O blood is a universal donor. Mm -hmm. And we could give type O blood to anybody. But what low titer O positive blood means is there that there are people out in the population that have such low... RH antibodies that it won't affect another person. All right. So it's basically we're, we're looking at O blood. Yeah. Just plain O, o, bl o blood. <laughs> which which is fantastic because it doesn't have any of these problems to attack. And and like you said, that RH factor is so minuscule. Yeah. There's not really a lot for antibodies to go after and attack and cause these problems. And I think even in the studies that they have done, given low titer O positive blood, it's in the million millions of people that they've given it to it's in the single digits of how many people have had a reaction to it it's, it's very small in fact a lot of uh our civilian pre-hospital programs the the literature it's based on in those research there was a case of an infusion reaction and it was it was due to a clerical error actually it wasn't an, a true blood reaction well, it was a true blood reaction because the blood was mislabeled. It was not low titer O positive blood. So when the person reacted to that blood, it made a lot of sense. It was not an actual reaction to low titer O positive blood. It was something else. So you're right. Incredibly safe. Yes. Uh, the the risk is is minimal for the benefit we get, especially like this is incredible benefit. So you will see low titer O positive whole blood. And the reason low titer O positive whole blood has become a, a, a thing is that it is more, uh, it exists more in the population than O negative blood, yes. which is truly like the universal donor because it doesn't have the RH factor and it's O, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's not as common as the O positive blood. So it's a limited supply to begin with. And then when I donate, donate blood, it's most likely that they're going to separate out my blood into components into red blood cells, plasma, and platelets because it's O negative and it can be so well received by anybody that we go that way. Um, that's how we shifted towards O positive blood and it being low titer that, hey, this is a thing. This could work. Okay. Uh, so I'll take a moment. Shameless plug. Go to donate blood. Let go. Uh, whether you're O or not, like let's just get more blood into the system. Well, also, the summertime is coming around, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, again, more blood usage during the summer, but less donation. Less donation. Everybody's out on vacation. Yeah, yeah. Please go donate blood. Yes. And you go ahead and keep an eye on the city of Sugarland. We have regular blood drives, and we'll get you some opportunities to, to bleed in there. Don't worry. All right. O positive, low titer blood is phenomenal. It's great. Let's compare it to what we classically do. Um we get the, the nasty, gnarly trauma, or we get the person puking blood all over the place. They are tachycardic, they're hypotensive, and they look like garbage. Classically, what would we do to treat that person, Aaron? Classically, what we've been taught. Yeah. Establish two large bore IVs. Yeah. Massive amounts of saline. Mm. Just fully wide open, mm -hmm. running in. Lots bags of bags and bags yeah. of saline. Just get, to get that volume up. Get, get that, that volume up. Right. Why not? Uh, good thing or bad thing? Bad, no. Bad. We are now learning this yeah. is bad. Okay. Our normal blood pH, 
seven three seven point four yeah. around there. What's the pH of saline? Five point five. Ooh, makes it very acidic. That's acidic. Yes. Yes. Uh, seven point four is is just slightly to the basic side. We as humans like to be basic, mm-hmm. not basic AF, just just a little <laughs> basic. Right. Um, we're going to talk about this in a, another conversation, another time, but bleeding excessively just produces an acidotic state to begin with. Mm-hmm. And we're taught to put a bunch of saline in that. We're now perpetuating the acidosis, okay. which the body doesn't like. Like yeah. it causes a lot of derangements. Um, what kind of things come out of massive saline volume infusions in these patients? So we got acute respiratory distress. Yeah, we can flood the lungs with fluid, mm-hmm. you know, cause pneumonia long term. Uh, we mess with the coagulation factors in the mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, we're trying to stop that bleeding. Yeah. But what are we doing? We're just diluting that blood. We're washing away those factors. Yeah. The, you know? the things we need aren't in saline. Yeah. We're going to increase hypoxia again. We don't have any red blood cells. We're washing out those red blood cells. So that O2 molecule can't be on those red blood cells to carry it to the yeah. lungs into the heart. It, it becomes a semantics thing. And I love semantics because words matter that we have this bleeding patient. We're like, oh, no, we got to get their blood pressure up. The blood pressure isn't what makes them live. Yeah. The cellular perfusion is what makes them live. And saline doesn't perfuse cells. Okay. So you, you can have a great pressure. Let's pull them with. <laughs> Tons of pressors and tons of saline, and we'll have a pressure for a period of time, yeah. <laughs> but we will have no perfusion. We will have cells dying. We will have an acidotic state, and then we will have a case study later of I had a pressure of 120 over 80. What gives? And yeah. you're right. We uh, it's it's the whole salt water is good for pasta, yeah. not for <laughs> resuscitation. Uh, that's an Andrew Fisher ism. If you don't know Andrew Fisher, go take a look. Uh, he's probably the single name that you can attach to pre-hospital blood programs coming out of the military uh, processes and research and I don't know. Yes, good for pasta, not good <laughs> for resuscitation. The other problem we do with saline is it's Texas. It's hot yeah, in the summer. It is. So what What do I like to do in the back of my ambulance? And I know me, when <laughs> summertime comes around, I kick that AC up all the way. Mm-hmm. So Again. even if... Even if it's not working well, and the back of this ambulance is 80, 85 degrees. Still not. It's room temperature. Room temperature. That's where our saline exists. That's a pretty big difference between body temperature and room temperature. Let's say your AC is working great. We got a new medic unit coming. It really kicks on, and we have 75 degree saline. Um, That's going to suck a lot of body heat out. And how how does that work out in trauma? How does that work out for us? So, yeah, the body is already losing fluid. The person or the patient is probably already cold. We're going to cause unintentional hypothermia. Hypothermia in Houston in summertime. Yes. As it's crazy a, as it sounds. It's a thing. It's a thing. Right. And we talk about it with our trauma management. You should be sweating buckets yes. when you're managing your trauma patients in the back of this ambulance. They need to be warm. You're right. We we'll talk about hypothermia and the challenges it presents in, in bleeding cases. We talk about it in trauma, but let's be clear. This is bleeding, period. This is obstetrical bleeding. This is GI bleeding that's been going on for however long. Like, medical bleeding is a thing and causes a lot of the same problems. Yes. So this is not just a traumatic bleeding problem. Those are just the most obvious. Yeah. Medical just takes a little bit more detective work. Yes. So we we dump a, a, a acid, salty acid that's cold <laughs> into this person uh, the body likes homeostasis. There's a fancy word, science class. It means we like things to stay the same. We don't like change. So whatever caused the bleeding is a change. And then we go shift the pH. That's a change. We go shift the temperature. That's a change. Mm. So everything's already working against us. Yes. Already. The body systems work in a narrow range. And outside of this range of things, they start to fail. Yep. And let's talk about clotting doesn't work when the body's cold. <laughs> clotting doesn't work when we're acidotic. All right. Again, next conversation segueing into that of, of where that leads to coagulopathy and death. But saline, so not a yep. great choice in volume resuscitation. No. What's a better choice, Aaron? Plasma. Plasma is great. Yes. This has classically been our first choice. What is plasma? 
So plasma is basically a component of blood. Okay. The liquid component. Yeah. Right? Okay. And what's in there? Clotting factors. All right. Okay. Yep. We like those in bleeding. We do like clotting factors. There's another little hidden piece in plasma too, which is interesting. Plasma could be used for treating some angioedema and people's like, wow, that's kind of wild. That's out there. There's proteins that still exist in the plasma that stunt the inflammatory process. Injury happens, uh, any injury, right? Yeah. And it swells. Yeah. It's a protective mechanism. But in massive trauma, that inflammation causes damage to tissues. That's where we get the uh, pulmonary edema, that those vessels are damaged and permeable. And the proteins in plasma reverse that inflammation and actually they, restore the integrity of those vessels. So, they do. As soon as you start administering it, it goes to work immediately. It starts repairing. You don't see it, mm -hmm. but internally... It does start repairing. Yeah, there's a lot of amazing bent out of out of a unit of plasma, yeah. right? Um, and the key is it's it the volume expander, that right? Is. Saline will expand volume, yeah, kind of. If we have the edema going on; it'll get third spaced, but we can put enough in there to expand volume. Plasma is a legitimate volume expander. It stops. Uh, it starts reversing some of the damage that's there. You're right; the clotting factors are there that we need. Um, We'll talk about how coagulopathy is a breakdown in the clotting process, but it could also just be that we have overrun the clotting process. The bleeding is so massive, the body can't catch up. So we'll put some more clotting factors in to help yeah. out. Um, but there's a, a limitation to plasma. It'll do these things. It'll help. Uh, what does it not have? What is it not helping us really do that we need? It doesn't have the red blood cells. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's not helping us carry the oxygen to the tissues yeah and that's really where we get a lot of the acidosis also is that right. oxygen doesn't get to tissues anaerobic respiration a lot of dirty product out of anaerobic yeah. respiration um right so we need we need oxygen we do so as fabulous as plasma is it is limited that it doesn't have the oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells yeah Ooh. likewise you give uh Packed red blood cells, another component that it's separated. And packed red blood cells doesn't have all the stuff the plasma has. It now, doesn't have clotting factors. It doesn't it's have give or take. Expansion, right? It's give Damn. or take, yeah. It's like when uh, it's like when mom makes you take your little brother to your friend's house. Like, you know, okay, it's probably better than that. I like using that one because I was the little brother that had to go. <laughs> you want these two together. Like, these two are good friends. Yeah. There's a third one, though. What's our third component of blood? Packed red blood cells. We talk about packed red blood cells. What's we got plasma, packed red blood cells, and then we got platelets. Platelets. Yep. Um, what are what are platelets? Platelets are getting platelets separated out from the blood. Yep. Yeah. They're not red blood cells. It's not plasma, but it's just kind of like its own its own little thing off to the side. These are the actual building blocks of clots. Get yeah, right. Um, so. Mass transfusion usually gets one of each of these, a ratio of one of each. Yes. Uh, the platelets, the plasma, the red blood cells. For us, carrying components, we'll have red blood cells and we will have plasma. We will not have platelets. Yeah. That's because platelets last about five days on the shelf. So that's, I mean, we're going to waste a lot of platelets. Yeah. That we're not giving blood every five days. But red blood cells and plasma last a bit longer. Whole blood lasts a bit longer. So we have these three pieces of blood. Um we talked about how great plasma is. We talked about how great red blood cells are. We don't have platelets in our component therapy. What's what's the ultimate solution to volume resuscitation in these people? Whole red blood. Or whole, whole red blood. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it's red, yes. Yeah, hopefully. Oh, man. Yeah. All right, so we... So, yeah. So, whole blood yeah, yeah. is all of this. Like, yes. that's why it's whole blood, right? It, it's all of the components together. Um Logistically, it's it's so much easier. Yes. It's one administration for all of these things. Um, actually, we get a a good amount of the clotting factors in plasma, but whole blood's got more. Yes, right. Like the the just the the process eliminates some of them. So, um, I'm excited about. Mm. So we get all the same things. We get the uh, 
repairing damaged tissues, stunting the inflammatory process that's causing trouble. We get the volume expansion. We get the oxygen carrying capacity. We get the platelets are in the whole blood that help the clotting. Holy cow. It's all in one. <laughs> right? In one deal. So classically, we're taught leaders and leaders of sailing for resuscitation. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you anticipate for the amount of volume of whole blood we need to put back into somebody? What would you think? compared on like what we typically were taught. So the volume on whole blood that we need to put in, it'd probably be almost about half about the blood that we need to put into somebody versus the leaders and leaders of normal saline that we would infuse to people. Yeah. It's, it is, my experience has been, has been significantly less yeah. that we're, we're not going to carry units and units of blood. We're going to have a unit of blood. And it's going to make such a significant impact in just a single unit because of these things. The reasons we always, the reason we always went leaders and leaders and leaders of saline is because it did nothing to help. Yeah. Every ounce of blood going into somebody is going to be doing the work. Like you said, yeah. it gets in there, it goes to work. And uh, we'll talk about some permissive hypotension and we're not resuscitating to a 120 over 80 kind of blood pressure. Um but remember the things we're, we're restoring perfusion is what we need. Yes. And this does it right out of the gate. Um, it's, it's almost astonishing how little blood we need to produce a positive impact compared to what we classically have experienced with yeah. saline. Like it's, 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 it's crazy. It, it just seems so common sense. This yes. person has lost a lot of blood. Well, we need to put blood in them. Well, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but don't do that. Saline is stuff. Yeah. Right. It is. Let's let's be honest. A, a blood program is logistically challenging. It is expensive. It is. It, it is what it is. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that an early unit or two of blood pushes off mass transfusion. That this isn't even that we give the first unit of blood and they're still going to get ten to twelve later. They may if they're that injured, yeah. that sick. Um, mass transfusion protocol tends to have. Uh, poor outcomes associated with it yeah. because of how sick people are, not because mass transfusions, but, but that's a lot of undoing damage. It and is where we start to repair damage early. We, there's actually better outcomes with less blood earlier than lots of blood later. And that's, yeah. that's really our opportunity here. Yeah. The quicker we can get them that blood, mm -hmm. possibly the better outcome that they'll have at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the time metric that, I've seen in some of the studies is the time from activation of the mass transfusion protocol to the cooler actually being there and starting it, uh, you know, and obviously more time that goes by, the worse the outcome associated with that event. But realistically, we're, we're the initiation of the protocol. Like it's, it's the identifying the need. Mm -hmm. So when we see this patient, we identify the need because it's, holy cow, they're sick. They're a level one trauma patient. Let's start heading downtown with them. While they haven't started their timer of mass transfusion protocol, we started the patient's timer. Yes. So we are really doing an amazing thing by reducing that cooler time that we're going to have this person there. We're going to have blood. Like you're going to hold your hand. Yeah, right there and just take go. Right. Um, also, the blood stored cold. Yes. Are we giving cold blood? No. No, no, no. Again, induced hypothermia. Mm -hmm. We want to get away from unintentional induced hypothermia yeah. but we do carry this nice little little gadget mm -hmm. yeah it's gonna warm it up yeah like 100 degree blood it's actually about yeah. perk that temperature up real nice the instant warming of it <laughs> yes which really what i'll give you is if you don't have yeah. blood and you're managing trauma patients with saline because that's what you have available do what you can to warm it up Yes. At the least, let's give some warm saline, which is, again, seems crazy that it's 110 degree heat index. Houston in the summer. This guy's an idiot. <laughs> Tell me I'm not an idiot, Aaron. No, you're not an idiot. Thanks for validating <laughs> me. I appreciate it. This is why I had you. <laughs> warm it up, right? Warm it up. I mean, before this, before doing all the research, I would have never thought to give at least warm saline. Mm hmm. To a trauma patient or any patient in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 we, when we know better, yeah. we can do better. And here yes, we are. we are. Well, Aaron, I appreciate the time this morning and the effort for this. Thanks for doing uh, the research, uh, the conversation. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we'll catch you for the next one. 